Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to today's event organized jointly by the Afghan Institute for Strategic Studies and EU Watch. I'm really pleased today to be able to moderate such a distinguished panel of experts from Afghanistan and Europe on an important discussion on EU policy approaches and options towards Afghanistan. My name is Marika Theros. I am currently based at the London School of Economics and also at the Atlantic Council South Asia Center. Today's event is appropriately called the Taliban Conundrum, what next for the EU and Afghanistan? Ever since the Taliban regained control of Afghanistan, hopes by many in the West for a moderate Taliban regime have all but evaporated. Today, millions of Afghans face concurrent human rights, humanitarian, and political crises. After seizing power, the Taliban has severely restricted civic space, reinstituted forms of gender apartheid, engaged in human rights abuses, and rejected efforts to construct a nominally inclusive order. Their persecution of women, in particular, must not only be seen from a human rights imperative or lens, it has also severely limited the ability of the UN and aid organizations to effectively deliver assistance to the most vulnerable, including 20%, some 20% of female-headed health households. Today, the international community struggles to understand and to respond to these overlapping crises and the new realities in the country. Previous assurances of a moderate Taliban have quickly dissipated, while international leverage on the Taliban also appears to be waning. In this context, how international humanitarian, security, and political policies affect each other will need to be considered strategically to ensure it benefits the Afghan people, while not supporting the de facto authorities and consolidating their increasingly authoritarian rule. At the same time, debates on how the international community engages with the Taliban has sparked controversy with engagement often conflated um, with the path to recognition, a major demand of the, of the Taliban, but also a potential risk. Today, we have with us a very distinguished panel of speakers to help us understand both the evolving realities on the ground, as well as EU policy and approaches toward the country and towards its de facto authorities. We will start with an initial round of interventions by our speakers, and I will introduce each speaker before they get, begin. I do want to highlight, however, that one of our speakers, unfortunately, has a pressing meeting and will be joining us later, uh, Petras Ostrovichas, um, who is a Lithuanian politician and a member of the European Parliament. I plan to ask also, though, a second round of questions, if we have time, before opening up uh, to a Q&A from the audience. Please do send in your questions via the social media links or by the chat func functions. Um, so let's get started. I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, Ms. Darren Daria. She's the head of the Afghanistan and Pakistan Division in the external European External Action Service, which is the diplomatic service of the EU. Ms. Daria, the EU appears to be expanding its presence in Afghanistan and is also a big contributor to the humanitarian effort. Yet even humanitarian aid is replete with dilemmas and trade-offs. What is the EU position on this Afghanistan and specifically towards engagement with the de facto authorities? What does engagement actually look like in this context? Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Theros, uh, for the question and thank you for having invited me to be amongst this distinguished panel. Um, let me start with the EU policy on Afghanistan. EU policy on Afghanistan since uh, the Taliban takeover and even before, uh, but especially since the ta Taliban takeover in August 2021 has been very clear that the EU would stand by the Afghan people and the EU would continue its activities uh, in support and for the benefit uh, directly of the Afghan people. Uh, what has this meant? Um, it meant practically that um, the EU humanitarian uh, actors, um, our colleagues delivering humanitarian aid, uh, have practically never left uh, Afghanistan. They have been in Kabul, they have been co uh, co coordinating and continuing humanitarian operations. As you said, we're one of the biggest humanitarian donors on the ground, and this has continued uh, without, without uh, a pause after the Taliban takeover. And we have also re-established our presence of our delegation at the level of Chargé d'Affaires uh, as of January 2022. This was a big decision to take. It was a very um, 
symbolic one as well, because the European Union uh, is the only, let's say, actor to the west of Ankara who had uh, originally evacuated uh, from Kabul, who, who have decided to go back because of uh, the importance and the message uh, that it, that would give to the Afghan people who are now facing a new reality. And it is also our imperative and our responsibility to face and to react to the new reality on the ground. And that includes engagement and discussions with the Taliban, amongst other things, because the EU presence on the ground and the European Union's special envoy on Afghanistan do regularly talk to the Taliban, but they also, and even more so, talk to non-Taliban Afghans, um, civil society, women. Um, and in fact, uh, the reason our EU special envoy could not be here today is because he's at a big meeting at, of the Afghan Women Leaders Forum organized by the EU. Um, and, uh, and we engage with civil society, we engage with the diaspora, we engage with the regional actors, and we try actively to, to find solutions to the problems we face. Uh, as you might be aware, on our engagement with the Taliban, uh, we have a very principled approach, uh, which is um, which is framed by five important benchmarks. Uh, number one being human rights and especially women's rights. And we can discuss the developments and the quite negative ones on that uh, since the Taliban takeover. Then inclusive governance so that uh, Afghanistan uh, would have a system where all Afghans would feel represented and would have the chance to feel represented and that um, the uh, the governance of Afghanistan would not be dominated by one ethnic group or one gender. Security and counterterrorism is a big priority, not just for us, for the regional actors, but also for the safety and security of people within Afghanistan. Access to humanitarian aid and the respect of international humanitarian law is one of our uh, benchmarks as well as continued freedom of movement of Afghan people uh, in, but especially outside uh, what we call the safe passage for those who do not feel secure and safe enough to live in Afghanistan any longer under the Taliban regime to be allowed to live, leave the country. And we continue our um, uh, safe passage operations as well. So those are the general principles and benchmarks under which we uh, engage uh, with the Taliban authorities, um, the de facto authorities, and these are the discussions that uh, that take place. Quite often, uh, quite tough discussions as well. However, we believe the importance of having that type of direct engagement, and I believe EU is one of the the few, if not the only, international player who actually enter in the room and addressed direct um, cases and human rights violations and issues with the Taliban uh, and women's rights issues and uh, inclusive governance issues. So, so th these are the parameters under which we we talk to them. These are the these are the principles because we are a principled actor and we we come uh, from a, a values based. Um, uh, system and and uh, and we follow our our um, values based and principled approach so I hope that answers uh, I know that I had a quick five minutes to to recap <laughs> the EU's policy which in, in in each and every one of those benchmarks is of course a discussion in itself but I hope that captures quickly uh, the the basic parameters of our engagement thank you it does and I'm sure we'll be coming back to you for more detail but I'd like to now turn to our next speaker, Ambassador Andisha. He is an academic and the ambassador and permanent representative of Afghanistan to the UN in Geneva. And of course he remains deeply engaged with many networks and groups in the country. Ambassador, since the Taliban military took over, they have been credited a lot with ending conflict and establishing security, despite the fact that, you know, despite you know the presence of um, human rights abuses and and uh, and their struggle to rein in terrorist groups, especially the Islamic State of as Khorasan, and many are worried now about the spillover effects in the region. Could you give us a bit more understanding of what some of the current security dynamics and how the EU might approach these issues? Uh, thank you very much, Marika, and it's also good to be among this uh, distinguished panels and my greetings and salam to uh, to all participants and, and viewers of this uh, webinar and thanks to the uh, Institute for organizing it. Uh, 
think the, the question of uh, security um, in Afghanistan, it depends on how you uh, define and how you look at the security. Uh, and the, this idea of you know, Taliban being credited, I think this is, this is perhaps now a narrative, which uh, maybe um, at the very beginning or in the first year of the Taliban, that was uh, something to, to reckon with, uh, given there was no other narrative to be to be put forward uh, to justify that how they come and take over the country. Uh, but now I think, you know, with uh, not what with what the people of Afghanistan are saying, because I think there are very few uh, ears to to listen to that. But uh, but what these uh, very recent reports uh, coming out of the international community is also indicating, you know, uh, the recent report of the EU um, security division, which is um, very, you know, elaborate on what are the security risks which are emanating out of Afghanistan, but what kind of uh, strategic and security uh, vacuum uh, uh, which has been created and has not been filled yet. And then, of course, a very recent uh, UN sanction committee or, or uh, 1988 committee, which uh, you know, a very uh, graphic description of, of uh, the symbiotic relationship between the Taliban and all Al-Qaeda and, and the other uh, groups. And how it's, you know, it is a powder cake, basically, uh, which is probably, you know, a, a calm before uh, a storm. So I think this is the way you will, uh, you can define it. And also, you know, there's an historical analogy is that some people used to say that, uh, that uh, you know, crediting Taliban for the security in Afghanistan is like crediting Hitler for, you know, security in France, because there was so much chaos in the early 1940s there, you know, political chaos, you know, military security, everything. And then he, he came and he secured, you know, the, uh, the country. Uh, I think going above and beyond this, uh, so I, uh, we can see that, uh, that perhaps there is this narrow definition of security, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, no high level of violence, uh, despite some, you know, uh, problems here and there. Uh, but then uh, when you when you define it in terms of real security and human security and you know sustainable security which uh, emanates out of uh, uh, what uh, the priorities that uh, uh, Ms. Daria she mentioned the way that uh, that you know you have to look at the priorities of the international community but also I think is the same the priorities of the people of Afghanistan which is human rights and the humanitarian uh, uh, fields in humanitarian areas then uh, an inclusive and representative government, and then you know the security apparatus and system which is responsible and accountable to uh, you know to to, to the elected uh, government. Uh, but at the same time, uh, international relations and the regional relation, which is based on the principles, the principles of the UN Charter, principles of the good neighborly relations that Afghanistan had, and the principles of all you know, intergovernmental organization, which Afghanistan is and was uh, a part. Of. I think if you put it in this perspective, we will find out that, you know, there is perhaps low level of violence going on in the country. But in terms of security, I think we are worse off because it's, you know, an impending crisis, uh, which can blow any moment at any time. We can see the movements, we see the dynamics of the regional security, we see, the, you know, the problems and the uh, border regions with Pakistan, with uh, you know, with Iran, the presence of all of these groups and the way these groups are moving, you know, in different parts of the country. I think it's just a matter of time, and and I think we have to be much more worried about the security situation in Afghanistan. In in you know, if not in if if not in you know, in a couple of months, but but in one or two years to come. Thank you, Ambassador, and for also for reminding us that um, we need to take a broader concept of human security to really understand the dynamics on the ground. Um, I'd now like to turn to Bismillah Elizada. He's an expert analyst and also a PhD student at SOAS. He's also the co-founder of Rahila Foundation, an organization that works for youth empowerment through education and capacity building. Ismaila, current Afghan international debates on engagement and recognition have become increasingly polarized, with many fearing, as I had mentioned before, that engagement would lead to recognition in ways that would legitimate uh, an increasingly sort of exclusionary rule. 
what forms of principled engagement uh, may be possible in the current context, you know, reflecting perhaps a little bit on what Ms. Daria mentioned, and also how can the EU support the Afghan people? Uh, thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, um, I would like to look very closely at uh, what Ms. Daria presented as five benchmarks for principled engagement uh, of EU with the current um, quote unquote de facto um, authorities in Afghanistan. So basically, uh, it's important to, you know, ask the very important question of how do we measure um, compliance by these um, uh, five uh, principles and where do we go with it? Uh, meaning if there is any uh, non-compliance, then what will be the consequences and uh, the repercussions uh, to the Taliban? These are um, unfortunately very unclear. Um, and it seems to me that um, unfortunately, the EU has been sort of like just trying to, uh, you know, put out these uh, five benchmarks as to principles uh, for its engagement with the Taliban, only for some good PR, um, or otherwise, you know, it really needs some very robust mechanisms for uh, for, for measurement um, and, and reporting, and also sort of like defined next steps as to uh, what non-compliance would lead to. Now I'll uh, I'll give you uh, you know some some examples of how each of these uh, five principles have been violated previously by the Taliban. Uh, yet the EU relationship and engagement with the Taliban has only uh, improved uh, for the past twenty to twenty one months. So number one, uh, as um, Starian also uh, mentioned, is respect for human rights. You know recent uh, reports by respectable international organizations like Amnesty International shows that uh, the Taliban regime is uh, committing all sorts of crimes, including the war crime of collective punishment, for instance, against uh, the people in Panjshir uh, or uh, also in Berlin. Other crimes, like crimes against humanity of gender apartheid, for instance, forced eviction of people, for instance, Hazaras and uh, Tajiks uh, and Uzbeks from different places, uh, which can be potentially a case for genocide, post disappearance uh, of, of activists and civil society actors, summary executions, tortures, and many more. But none of these you know, violations of the first principle of EU has led to anything, uh, not, not, even, not even a serious condemnation, unfortunately. And the second um, principle, which is inclusive political process, you know, uh, you know, it hasn't been really um, defined as to what process this uh, is and who will be included, in what ways uh, they should be included, and who defines uh, this, uh, you know, uh, benchmarks for inclusion and, and, and non-exclusion. Because mostly what uh, the international actors, including the EU, is trying to uh, go with is, you know, bringing more of the elites uh, of different uh, backgrounds uh, within the government, which is not really, really a solution. Uh, we need um, a democratic and representative, as uh, Ambassador Andisha also emphasized, a democratic and uh, representative, you know, uh, state structure in place uh, that can ensure that all strata of the society can be uh, represented. In counterterrorism uh, commitments, of course, the new report, as Dr. Andisha also alluded to, Show, uh, shows that ISKP uh, and uh, Al Qaeda, TTP, you know, like uh, nearly 20 other uh, terrorist organizations are active in Afghanistan. And more like, you know, warningly, uh, there are four at least uh, senior Taliban uh, leaders, senior Taliban uh, officials uh, who uh, also enjoy mem membership in, uh, in Al Qaeda, for instance. And same is the case with other, you know, um, others of these principles. So what I would propose is, uh, you know, first of all, that the people of Afghanistan need to be uh, engaged and need to be on the table where the uh, principles for engagement are defined. Um, and this would need an inclusive and robust mechanism. Uh, second of all, I think it's important for the EU to also act collectively with other actors um, like the UN and, and other members of the international community uh, to be able to maximize the uh, potential and the uh, pressure capacity uh, that it will be able to exert. 
And another thing that's important is, you know, recognition should be granted only to a government that, that is legitimately representative of the people of Afghanistan. Uh, and nothing short of that should be short of that should be acceptable. And from the EU and other, uh, you know, members of the international community, this needs to be very clearly put forward. And finally, I think it's important to emphasize that the reality in Afghanistan is much more bigger than uh, the Taliban. You know, the people of Afghanistan, uh, over like 35 million people who live in Afghanistan right now, they're a much bigger reality than uh, what is usually said to be the reality in Afghanistan. So people, uh, you know, activists and uh, international actors like the EU, they need to uh, keep that in perspective uh, that there is a bigger reality in Afghanistan. Therefore, uh, it shouldn't be an excuse that the Taliban is the only reality on the ground. Therefore, there is no other way uh, to go about it. Thank you, Mr. Alizada. I'd now like to turn to Ms. Hasna Jalil, who is the Deputy Minister for Policy and Strategy for the Interior and also formerly Deputy, Ministry, uh, Deputy Minister of Policy and Planning at the Ministry of Women's Affairs. Hasna, as Deputy Minister of Interior, you were able to observe many of the sort of urban and rural dynamics that many people discussed as enabling the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Today, some of those dynamics have shifted while others have persisted. Could you please tell us a little bit more um, so that the international com community, how, how the international community should understand these dynamics on the ground and how through this understanding, it could inform EU approaches? Well, thank you, Marika, and thanks to the colleagues from um, uh, AISIS for organizing this event. And it's such a pleasure to join this panel with, uh, or this discussion with Andy Shasai, Balizad Asai, uh, Ms. Daria, and our other panelists. Um, I mean, the divide is not something that we can say it exists only in Afghanistan, it exists in the US as well. Um, I mean, being a superpower. Uh, but at the same time in Afghanistan, for as long as I can look back into the history, it has been there. It, it isn't um, a post-2001 phenomenon. Uh, but then at the same time, I think the Afghan government that was established post-2001 was established in a terribly chaotic situation. After years of war, and then we had the Taliban's oppressive regime, which was no different than the one we are dealing with right now. There was a mistrust between all the elements in the community, all the different factions in the community, all the different genders, different ethnicities, different tribes within, an, I mean, every ethnicity. No one trusted literally anyone because they have been surviving, running around um, for, for decades actually. But then we had the regime which was dealing with a um, terrible insurgency and terrorism in the country. Um, Partially, the regime hasn't been able to establish its presence beyond military bases or beyond a military presence in, in uh, different parts of the country. Um, there has been, I mean, there clearly has been a, a gap left by the government in terms of the services, in terms of the, um, the civilian face of the government. Uh, beyond the military bases that we used to have in, in different parts of the country. And the Taliban actually didn't offer anything in terms of the government services or in terms of um, public services. They have been present there. So Taliban clearly, of course, the um, insurgency with an element or a strategy, um, I mean, using terrorism as a strategy and then having elements of terrorism within their group, uh, they recruited from the rural areas clearly, but then at the same time, um, they started the war from the rural areas. Um, I mean, from my point of view, there has been factors that, um, I can't say it widened the gap, but I would say it uh, made it difficult for the government to fill that gap or bridge that gap. Economic inequality, in terms the inequality in terms of economic development was there, and that is a natural process when um, uh, the reconstruction effort was going on. So, the priority was the urban areas, and then we had the political participation, which was another grievance of the rural um, 
population, even though there has been representatives of the rural population in the central government, but I think a major number of them, I mean, I do have my colleagues here and they can add on that. Um, and the Shah Saib and Ali Zadasib from uh, the Afghan side, they have been representatives. I mean, they've been considered from the central government point of view that they are the representat representatives of the rural area, but um, somehow rural area didn't accept them as their representative. And the country was so divided actually. So that's also one of the um, factors. And then the other aspect of it was that the uh, share of the rural area was the insecurity and the security, the uh, military operations and the share of the uh, urban area was, um, I would say economic prosperity. And then at the same time, in terms of security, it was much better. So people had a better life. Um, and I, I would say the, the major factor among all of them was the exposure to information between the two different uh, sides of the country, I mean, um, populations. That is where the Taliban, of course, the Taliban themselves was, uh, themselves had the, the strategy to uh, ban media and then at the same time cut people's access to information that made it even more difficult for us to make sure that all the different parts of the country gets access to the same information. Um, that was something that created that gap and the Taliban used it at their advantage, clearly. Um, but that also created a very wrong assumption on the international community side that the Taliban are the representative of the 74 or 75% population. And if they would take over and they would be leading um, a new regime, then the insurgency would end, which was a wrong assumption. I mean, it's, it's, it's the... the um, a terrible assumption, actually. The Taliban took over. It did not only, um, didn't help with the uh, insurgency across the country. Yes, we don't have powerful um, or equally powerful um, armed groups against the Taliban, but they are on the way to get stronger. I mean, if you look back to like two, two years ago, we didn't have anything on the ground. But right now we do have two groups which are challenging the Taliban. And then in a couple of years, I think they're getting stronger. So the insurgency didn't end, the economic inequality didn't end, the political participation is even worse than that. Um, the poverty actually, the, the uh, rural areas share of poverty, that's getting worse than, than what it is now because the international community is not, not there. The NGOs, which was, I mean, who were supporting the rural areas with the economic uh, disparity was, was helping. So they, they are not on the ground anymore because of the regime. Um, it didn't solve anything, but I think it, uh, all the challenges that we had, but I think it added to the uh, problems that we had. And part of the reason was because we had a wrong assumption that the Taliban are representing rural areas. Yes, rural areas in Afghanistan might not have been extremely satisfied with the central government, but they didn't choose the Taliban as well. They might have wanted a third option that we didn't have back then as, I mean, a third option for the people to offer. Thank you, Ms. Jalil. I wanted to turn back to Ms. Daria um, to ask a little bit more about the principles of engagement, um, both in sort of reflecting Ms. Mala's question on sort of on the, you know, whether or not there's sort of mechanisms for monitoring and measuring uh, that type of engagement and whether there are any sanctions around it. At the same time, I wanted to sort of maybe ask to hear a little bit more on in engagement, you know, I think one of the worries is that engagement leads to recognition and if, if there are conditions towards it, or is it more about sort of substantive engagement on access and, and other sort of technical issues on the ground around humanitarian aid? Thank you for the questions and the comments. Um, um... I do appreciate that there is a lot of attention on the engagement, but I would not like to reduce the EU's involvement and in all the activities on the ground just to engagement with the Taliban. As I tried to outline from the beginning, uh, there is even more engagement with uh, non-Taliban <laughs> Afghans, with the diaspora and with Afghan people uh, on the ground. This is why we went back to Kabul and our presence on the ground in itself helps us understand the situation better. 
um, and, and to be able to uh, observe the situation and to monitor. It also helps us monitor also the implementation of our programs, the principled implementation of, of our programs, none of which, by the way, go through the Taliban authorities, because this was a decision taken from the first day that you see that the traditional development assistance, but we continued um, with even increased budgetary resources to provide assistance uh, for the benefit of the Afghan people directly to the Afghan people. Um, after the Taliban takeover, um, and we did so mainly via the UN, but after the Taliban takeover, the, the traditional, let's say, uh, civil society actors and defenders on the ground, um, th this network was also disrupted because a lot of people have, uh, have left Afghanistan. So there has been a lot of work to, to support uh, that civic space for civil society to continue to function for those who chose to remain behind uh, or who had no other option but to remain behind in Afghanistan uh, to continue their livelihoods, to be able to continue having that space uh, for their operations, but also for, uh, you know, support, not just humanitarian or in terms of food, but their basic needs, healthcare, on the education sector, you know, we we tried very hard and we fought very hard uh, to to keep the the schools open for girls. Um, on as on the ban of uh, Afghan women working for NGOs and later working for the UN, the EU's reaction was swift and very strong, uh, and the, the assistance was paused, and we condemned in no unequal terms and very publicly all these decisions. And we have been there to react. To, um, to, to discuss and to basically contribute to solutions for this, for the benefit of the people who are still there. Um, I appreciate that, of course, uh, those who try, those who remain behind and those who really uh, put their, themselves on the front line will also face a number of criticism, but the criticism also has to be fair. Um, and uh, I would also like, uh, you know, to, to, to hear about who else uh, engages with the Taliban and directly uh, and with no, um, no um, you know, de deterrence or, or qualms whatsoever raises these issues and the violations and the rights of women. Because, you know, the regional actors and other countries are also very actively engaging with the Taliban. Um, but we can see that uh, you know approaches are not, let's say, as principled or as uh, human rights oriented and and as inclusive uh, um, as the EU sometimes, and there is a, a very much a need. And there was a question asked about how to connect with other other actors and how to uh, keep a coherent international line because a coherent international mess messaging um, is extremely important. And in that sense, the meeting organized by the UN Secretary General Guterres in Doha in the beginning of May uh, was a very important step uh, to bring the international community, regional countries, principal countries and, and uh, uh, Muslim majority countries, they are also increasingly stepping in and questioning the, the interpretation of Islam, the implementation of, uh, of Islamic principles, uh, which is extremely important. It's extremely important that this comes from the Muslim majority countries um, uh, as well. So, so th these steps are being taken and, uh, and the international community is increasingly vocal. And uh, I think uh, there is uh, quite a lot of consensus as well. The biggest consensus is the principle of non-recognition. The principle of non-recognition remains and no one in the international community has wavered uh, from this principle. There have been um, maybe uh, more contacts or even Taliban appointed diplomats uh, being you know, uh, sent to, to regional um, neighboring countries. This has not been case, uh, been the case uh, within the European Union and the European Union member states remain unified uh, on this front. So there has not been any um, uh, watering down of the non-recognition principle, uh, even uh, while engaging and in discussion with the Taliban. And this I think has also been very clear to the de facto authorities. I would like to come back quickly on the on the human security issue because I think this is a very very important one. 
and, and also the links between these principles and the benchmarks and the issues we're talking about, because it is true that long-term stability in Afghanistan, long-term regional security is, in our opinion as well, dependent on an inclusive governance where Afghan people feel represented, where Afghan people have a say and where the rights of the Afghan people are not violated. And with that, we need to also ask ourselves the question of the domestic legitimacy. International recognition is one issue, but a Taliban concentrated only on international recognition or their international legitimacy is still not uh, a, 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 a de facto authority uh, able to deliver long-term stability for the Afghan people. As long as the concentration is not on their domestic legitimacy and representation of the people of Afghanistan, in the long term, uh, the risks of uh, destabilization, both for the country and for the region, will remain. So this remains the most important question. There are different actors um, of, uh, of opposition, be it within diaspora, be it uh, within the country. Uh, the EU has, has always also been clear that uh, we, we talk to everyone. We talk to all the Afghans for as long as we support we, we, we support all initiatives, as long as it's non-armed. We support all initiatives except armed violent activities um, for, you know, that that are constructive towards towards future um, uh, future inclusivity and uh, on all these discussions. But it is uh, up to uh, the different actors uh, to organize, to discuss, to come together, to come up with the ideas, uh, how and what type of governance, what type of future they want to see in Afghanistan. Um, uh, there was a there was a um, sort of an accusation that EU is bringing the elites. Um, we have also been extremely clear that the, firstly, the EU does not select who represents the Afghan people. This is, this is not our aim, this is not our goal, and this is, this is not for us to do. We engage with uh, the Afghan people. We, we, we talk with you know, whoever wants to come and talk with us. Um, we, we engage with them, but this is not a process of us selecting or us deciding for the future of Afghanistan that only and entirely belongs to the people of Afghanistan. And we have also been very clear that from inclusive governance, we do not understand bringing back the old political actors to power. This is not what is our definition of inclusivity. Since the beginning, I've been very clear, we want to see an Afghanistan where all Afghan people uh, have the chance to be represented and to feel represented and their voices heard. Um, I will stop there. I could go on and on about this, but I think that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Daria. That was really helpful. Um, I wanted to actually turn to Ambassador Andisha and both to ask him a little bit, uh, you know, Ms. Daria also mentioned a little bit about the difficult or the challenging regional environment and how regional countries are both posturing and engaging um, more broadly. So I wanted to, if you could sort of shed light a little bit on some of those dynamics and if you see uh, them shifting and evolving in the current context, given the rise of um, you know, some of the security challenge and, uh, and charges of terrorists, uh, of supporting terrorism. Okay. Uh, I think the, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, since 2001, there was sort of a much better consensus uh, within the Security Council, Afghanistan uh, mission, Afghanistan's you know humanitarian intervention, or the the first intervention, counterterrorism intervention, uh, had the support of the P5, and Afghanistan continued to have the support of P5. But I think somewhere around 2014, 15, uh, this there was you know this the whole divergence uh, on the issue of Afghanistan started. I don't know if it was linked to the uh, annexation of Crimea or, or or the other events you know around Syria and, and, and the Arab Spring but but the, after that we saw we know we noticed a sort of a, an increased divergence uh, of view and that actually really helped also the Taliban to uh, uh, to strengthen their you know uh, their terrorist activities uh, being able to move 
uh, beyond and above uh, their safe havens in Pakistan. And I think it continued up to the peace process to make it you know, fast forward. When, when in 2018, you know, there's the renewed uh, peace process uh, uh, sort of efforts uh, started, uh, again, the region uh, were not a major stakeholder. They were just kept outside. And this is what, you know, the irony of thing is that now you're trying to bring the UN as the main interlocutor, uh, which were supposed to be the main interlocutor in, in the past, you know, maybe uh, from, from the very beginning, uh, it's slow, it's sluggish, uh, you know, it's uh, probably, you know, uh, not, not very efficient organization, but it's, uh, I I everyone has a seat in it, especially when it comes to the region. So excluding uh, region in a meaningful way from the process in Afghanistan, uh, you know, contributed uh, to what we see at this stage, yeah? even with the failure of the Doha process. If you, if you look deeper into it, I think there was some, some sort of, you know, uh, race to bottom for reaching out to the Taliban without really even uh, uh, pushing them to clarify their definitions of, of you know, the terms of the peace process uh, and creation of, you know, multiple uh, parallel processes in the region, which, you know, enable the Taliban to do what they want. But, but again, after 2021, the idea was that the U.S. and NATO is defeated and now it's the region time just to fill the gap. But we find out that this is not the case. And the region might uh, feel that strategically they have gained something, which was very clear in the first days from the Pakistani uh, uh, National Security Advisor, you know, uh, Moed Yusuf uh, was very openly saying that, you know, we have, uh, we have a strategic gain in Afghanistan vis-a-vis uh, -vis many of our competitors. So the rest is, you know, tactical things and we will solve it. But now it seems that even that nobody has gained some sort of a strategic uh, uh, gain there because nobody's really stepping in to fill the vacuum. There is a vacuum. The Chinese are not coming in a way they were, people were expecting them to come. The Russians are busy in their own things. The Iranians have their own problem within the, you know, uh, in the border areas and with the water and, and, uh, and other issues. And Pakistan is probably the one which is, you know, had the most right now. And the question of, TTP being moved from south of Afghanistan to north is just moving the same way that ATIM is moved from Badakhshan to Baghlan. So I think this, the whole dynamic of region is, was, you know, somehow the region at some stage were united in sort of, you know, inflicting pain on, on NATO and US. <laughs> but now that, you know, there is, uh, there is this vacuum, nobody is able and willing to fill it. And still in the international community, in the UN, the blame game is going on, even within you know the security the Human Rights Council, where there's supposed to be a convergence on the atrocities which are happening, you know, in Afghanistan. This gender apartheid, which is you know a new term, uh, um, you know, this the Panjshir report has come, extrajudicial killings, which are clear case of violation of you know humanitarian law and war crimes, uh, and, and and many others. But still, you know, it's blaming that who did what and who is now responsible. And I think that's why when I say that we have to have a very deep and somber uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, look into the security situation in Afghanistan is because of this, that uh, there is no one responsible. Uh, nobody is uh, really sure what to do. And everyone trying to contain the Taliban's threat by keeping some line of engagement. You know, for example, uh, if you go to Washington, they will tell you that, I'm sorry, the Taliban sucks, but we have counterterrorism in them. But what that counterterrorism means, you know, with an organization like Taliban, which are harboring uh, all the terrorists, and they are still in the, you know, in the FBI most wanted list. I mean, the thing is that there might be some sort of, you know, a low level counterterrorism cooperation, but that's very tactical, transactional, and confusing because Taliban have different agreements of counterterrorism with different countries. With Indians, they have a separate counterterrorism cooperation uh, with uh, probably with the Pakistanis have their own arrangement with the Iranians and with the United States. And that's why, you know, for EU has sort of, you know, the next door, if you think of the EU Asia and, you know, uh, Turkey and, and all these migration waves you know, from, from different parts, you know, from different directions and the methamphetamine and, and, and drug trades and, and even, even this, you know, um, weapons and ammunition, which are the stockpiles of this and Afghanistan, 
Uh, I think all of this is at the doorstep of EU, and I understand that EU has both security sort of concern, which I think has, has been uh, sort of projected in this new paper, where it even shows the uh, uh, concern about the passports being distributed by Taliban to a number of terrorist organizations. The easy way to make a foreign fighter an Afghan fighter is just to give them a passport. So it's, uh, I think these are the things that you can see and EU's uh, sort of uh, framework agreements or, or dialogue with Central Asia, I think is part of the whole idea. Maybe at one point there was an idea of cooperation through Central Asia, but now this is the idea of containment. To just, you know, to sum it up, everyone, everyone is looking into how to contain the threats of the Taliban into their region, into their areas. But this containment policy is, of course, short-term policy. And this uh, a flat will open one gate sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Andesha. If I may, I wanted to turn to our new speaker, Mr. P uh, Petras Ostrovicius. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, he is a Lithuanian politician and also a member of the European Parliament and the head of the European Parliament Association for Relations with Afghanistan. We've had a wide ranging conversation so far talking both about EU sort of principled approaches um, in terms of their engagement with the Taliban, but also in terms of sort of the wide range of EU activities to support the Afghan people. We've also talked about the evolving security dynamics and how that should influence the way in which um, the EU approaches Afghanistan. I thought I would love to hear from you on sort of what is the stance of the EU Parliament towards Afghanistan, towards engagement, towards the humanitarian context, especially given the many dilemmas and trade-offs that we now see emerge, um, and on what issues um, should, you know, shouldn't, I mean, we've, we heard a little bit from your colleague, Ms. Daria, but on what issues does the Parliament uh, sort of focus on in terms of its engagement with Afghanistan? Thank you. And let me to explain why I'm so late, uh, probably at the, at the last quarter of uh, this great uh, uh, discussion. So we have had uh, the negotiations among the political groups concerning the uh, this week uh, to be adopted uh, European Parliament's resolution on uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, relations and future of Ukraine. Another very painful and uh, complicated story, I have to admit, and negotiations took a bit longer. So that's why I apologize once again. It's not uh, uh, at the expense of uh, uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan deserves our attention, our investments, and our support, no doubt whatsoever. So we have invested uh, too much time and too much hopes, and uh, we have to respect uh, you know, uh, legitimate uh, uh, expectations of Afghan people, whom we supported uh, uh, by many, many policy lines uh, during the last uh, two decades. So that's why we have to be looking at Afghanistan as uh, our joint uh, project with uh, Afghan people. I don't uh, speak about Taliban because I don't believe that Taliban is uh, a political force um, uh, which. Um, uh, once I mean to bring Afghanistan to a better future. So they have uh, own project for Afghanistan, uh, Afghan people, uh, with which we have certain disagreements. So that's why I have a couple of probably observations from uh, the delegation for Afghanistan side. Uh, I have to admit that we, we've been discussing and we will discuss the uh, situation in Afghanistan uh, as often as, uh, as it will be needed. I know that the uh, situation is not getting any easier, any better, in opposite. So we observe uh, um, uh, the uh, worsening of social economic situation, not to speak about political rights, especially for women. But um, what is important is not to engage into any new political experiments in Afghanistan, dealing with 
or to try to deal with Taliban, presuming that Taliban will change, uh, we will achieve a kind of compromise and uh, we will secure a better future by, by uh, those uh, actions, especially um, the future of uh, Afghan women. Afghan women, they represent 50% of population. They have absolutely uh, irreversible uh, impact on the uh, country's future. Uh, their contribution some years ago has been uh, something which uh, could offer much better future for Afghanistan, but because of the Taliban unilateral, unilateral, I would say departure from Doha agreements, because it was a part of the Doha agreements uh, to uh, keep uh, the society intact. And if you uh, exclude 50% of the society members from political and social life, I mean, how can you achieve uh, uh, the sustainable development of country? So that's why I don't think this, uh, that Taliban lives according to commitments achieved in, uh, in Doha. Although even at that time, all the agreements were not probably as perfect as somebody would expect. But recent developments in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan because of the Taliban unilateral decisions, uh, I think uh, presents us with a great challenge with a great challenge, which does not uh, have probably for the time of being any quick fix. So I think the mistake from our side would be immediately to try to find out uh, a new accommodation with the Taliban. I don't think uh, it might offer a better, a better option at all. Because I personally, I don't see Taliban as a reliable partner which um, shares a common, a common understanding with, uh, with us and Afghan women, generally speaking. So first principle. Second one, uh, we have to engage uh, even uh, more effectively and more substantially in delivering uh, humanitarian assistance uh, to the population, why uh, large parts of population of Afghanistan, in spite of uh, some uh, uh, financial uh, restrictions, and um, for the time of being, let's be frank, um, the pledge pledges are not enough to fill uh, the financial flows uh, for. Uh, um, humanitarian assistance to be provided to Afghan people. So we have to be more and more creative, uh, reaching out to uh, donors and uh, the international community in order to explain the situation on the ground in Afghanistan. And it's not a given process. I mean, we have to be more vigorous and probably more effective in this regard. But humanitarian assistance can't be can be something uh, uh, about which we, we, we should uh, debate. No, we have to deliver instead of debate. And thirdly, in any case, uh, uh, we have to see best possible and probably new innovative ways how to reach out um, um, those politically active, and socially effectively uh, working uh, uh, Afghan women to support them by innovative ways. Because uh, Taliban does not uh, restrict uh, uh, women's participation in, uh, in private business, for example. And how to combine those innovative ways uh, with uh, uh, our commitment to provide uh, uh, as much as possible assistance and not to, you know, uh, shut down any channels we had before, although uh, they're narrowing, let's agree on this, but to look for most innovative ways, how can uh, 
how can we uh, uh, reach out um, uh, larger parts of uh, Afghan society employing uh, any uh, services and any knowledge for uh, um, the uh, employing uh, Afghan women. So I know that uh, some institutions, some uh, international organizations are doing at most they can. Uh, and we have uh, own ways and own channels uh, to do it. So maybe, maybe, uh, let's go for the best, uh, might be more this kind of experience sharing and, uh, you know, uh, kind of innovative thinking. How can we um, uh, use new available channels in this regard? Because um, I'm sure, I mean, it gives certain hope for those who are so much, um, you know, uh, restricted uh, uh, from the any access to um, those social services and uh, activities which are naturally exist in any normal society. And uh, in Afghanistan, we have absolutely a very special case. Uh, it's it's something uh, about which probably we will uh, speak later, as um, as you know uh, the situation. Uh, uh, which uh, has created new challenges and uh, uh, very little of hope. So that's why these are my general thoughts. And I think uh, within the friends of Afghanistan in the European Parliament, and uh, believe me, there are many, many uh, good willing people and good willing uh, of my colleagues who um, constantly follow the situation in Afghanistan and come. Uh, Every time, with any possible solution and suggestion in this uh, in, in this regard, but um, um, most importantly now, I mean, not to restrict any humanitarian assistance assistance going and must to come uh, 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 to Afghanistan at shortest possible time, because each and every life in Afghanistan matters. And uh, there, there be, uh, there is no any political consideration in this regard. What comes to women's engagement, it's different. So that's why I would not compromise uh, on very risky things uh, with Taliban. Uh, probably I sound uh, very restrictive in this regard, but let me to keep my thoughts for myself because. Uh, Unfortunately, I have some experience uh, with Afghanistan and uh, the mistakes we made before uh, after uh, before uh, shouldn't be repeated uh, in uh, in future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to turn to my other panelists. I, I also understand that Ambassador Andisha has to leave at the moment. So I'm going to give you this if you want to say a couple final remarks uh, before we turn to the other panelists. Oh, thank you very much, and I'm sorry that I will, you know, break the rule of uh, the turns because I have to I have to leave quickly. But this is uh, an amazing discussion, and I know it will be very difficult to conclude, you know, in this uh, small round of uh, um, um, discussions. And uh, so, what I wanted to say about uh, just you know, uh, maybe I, I, I put some questions uh, for for the rest of us to to talk about and for the institute to pursue. Uh, I think, first of all, in terms of the EU's engagement in Afghanistan, uh, engagement in Afghanistan, not with Taliban, but with Afghanistan, is, is a principal partner. And it has been a principal partner. I think from day one, 21st of September, EU came with this, you know, five principles, and this is what they are following. I know the order is not reaching from number one to two to three, because they're stuck in number one or two, or between one and two. But at least in the one and two, which are humanitarian and human rights, uh, they, are, they have been very uh, consistent. I mean, I've, I've seen it here uh, with, with colleagues, uh, with EU delegation in Geneva, and this is one delegation which is basically supporting the mandate of the Special Rapporteur, and actually created basically the mandate of the Special Rapporteur. If it was not for the EU, it would have been almost impossible to have at least one ray of hope, which is, you know, Richard Benitez's uh, mandate, and, and we are seeing that it's expanding you know, in a few days, we have a huge delegation of uh, Afghan women coming from different places, including from Afghanistan, to discuss these new reports by, uh, you know, by the working group and by Richard. 
I think it's, there is there is that part. We have to give the you know the the credit when it's due. But number two is when the presence of EU in Kabul, of course, has many uh, benefits. And one benefit that, uh, that Darren, Darren has mentioned is that you know to keep an eye and air open. Uh, I would suggest, and this is what I told for the colleagues who are leaving, is that your air, your filters to the community is your national staff. And I know many of the national staff before the collapse, they left because I have friends, people who just left. And the new national staff that you have you know, recruited, you have to make sure that that represents a diversity. The same way that there was a question there that you, know, you have to have diverse panel. Uh, because if not, because I know it's very difficult for people, for some people even to cross the gates right now, let alone being recruited. So that has to be very, very you know, important. The same way that we see the difficulty of reaching out to different communities in terms of humanitarian aid, because humanitarian aid does not reach everywhere. I think this this is the 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 a little small suggestions, but they could, then then sort of my questions is that when we look at the priority number three, which for the region is priority number one, and that's the creation of an inclusive and representative government, which can solve all the other problems, including you know what what Petreas was saying. It's good to see him because we met in Brussels, you know, last time the ambassadors were there, and still we have the problem with the passports, you know, uh, <laughs> Mr. Petreas will. Talk about that maybe personally, is that uh, that the humanitarian cannot solve the problem, and I think priority number one has to be uh, 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 government structure. But then there is this myth. There are these these sort of you know vicious sort of or maybe inconclusive propositions which we see from our international friends. Number one, there is no alternative to the Taliban. I mean, there's a myth. Taliban were not alternative themselves. Suddenly they became alternative. And number two, they say that this alternative, which is going to be created or should be created by you, should be nonviolent. Okay, that's very good. And number three, we don't want to be seen creating the alternative or helping the alternative. I think it's going nowhere. You know, the, the propositions, if you put it, the conclusion is nil. No alternative, you know, it should be nonviolent and you should not be seen as uh, you know, creating the alternative. Uh, I think this, uh, because why? Because in the history of Afghanistan, we have many Afghan colleagues here in the panel. Also, it's good to see uh, Deputy Minister Jalil here, and also on the other side, uh, and, and all the other audience. That in the history of Afghanistan's modern state, 130, 135 years, we never had a government which is completely run by religious figures from the top to the you know, bottom. Always we had religious figures somewhere in the government, but it was a king, it was you know, somebody who was sort of a semi-secular state person. It's the first time in our history. And every time when the state is challenged or a state is structure or modern state is structure from education, from schools, schools have been always challenged, girls in schools in a hundred years. The challenge came from sort of you know, conservative religious elements of the society, which you know, galvanized the community against the state. And they used religion, they used ideology. So for them, it was easy because this is a very simple call. You call the religion and then people will come out. Even if people don't come out, they will not oppose you. They will be silent. So now the battle is upward. If we don't, if you put all these three conditions and then we have a religious government and for the first time in the history of Afghanistan. So it means the onus is on the civil society to raise up to a level where they can oppose a religious government, a government based on Sharia. So to change this in a non-violent way, a government which has you know, the whole brigade of suicide bombers has to be supported. So, and this means that the way that the civil society has to be helped is probably you have to multiply it you know, by, by, by a big number. So the civil society within the country outside the country and young democratic political forces. I think we should not be shy of using the word democracy. The democratic political forces has to be empowered. I mean, how can you know, democratic forces could be empowered in Iran? The, the, you know, the people could be empowered in Ukraine, but not you know, when it comes to Afghanistan, no. So I think if the, the, theme, the theme is that there has to be alternative, has to be nonviolent, I think there has to be lots more engagement both with the civil society within the country, civil society and democratic forces outside of Afghanistan, and to create the connections with a hope that, you know, that can change things. 
But of course, the region is not going to wait for the international community. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the, for their priority is to keep pushing the Taliban for so-called inclusive. Their definition of inclusive is perhaps very different from the definition of inclusive and representative that we are talking here. And I think with this, uh, maybe the questions or you know, thinkings, I will, I will uh, say thank you to everyone and I will excuse myself because I have to be in, <laughs> into another event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Andisha. I wanted to now turn to Hosna Jalil and actually ask her um, to reflect a little bit on some of these new innovative, you know, what types of innovative ways may the internationals engage at the local level, whether it is in the distribution and supporting a civil society in the distribution of aid, or whether it's also just in supporting space um, for you know specific space for different actors, especially women. Uh, thank you again, Marika. Um, when it comes to how European Union can help the Afghan people to engage in the overall, um, not just the resistance, but pressurizing the Taliban to open up to a more inclusive government, which is difficult, but of course not impossible. Um, we do have, I mean, we have developed um, um, comparably strong civil society on the ground in Afghanistan. And that is like we always say about the media, I think that is one of the greatest achievement, like the civil society is one of the greatest achievement we have, um, we have had in the last 20 years, which hasn't been as strong as, um, I mean, which hasn't been in the past as strong as it is now. Um, so yes, engaging with the civil society, supporting the civil society, um, um, I would say through monitoring and at the same time, uh, engaging them in the distribution of humanitarian aid, because that's one of the biggest lines of effort that most of the international community has. So there's, there are not much space actually to engage with the civil society beyond the humanitarian aid, um, uh, I would say, um, a package. So I think civil society, because one of the questions normally raises about uh, who is having access to the humanitarian aid. Is it the Taliban? And then the, the uh, question that recently is, is being uh, developed is, does the ISIS have um, access to the humanitarian aid? Are they misusing that like the Taliban used to misuse in the past 20 years? Um, there has to be some sort of local uh, monitoring mechanism on the ground, and that can be civil society in Afghanistan, particularly civil society which engages heavily with the women in Afghanistan. So uh, that's one of the major areas that I think uh, not only we empower civil society in the public eye, but we also help them with, the, with their mandate on, on the ground. So that is one of the areas that I think civil society can be engaged more and at the same time can be empowered. When it comes to the Afghan women's, um, I mean, the platforms for the Afghan women, I don't think what the Afghan women on the ground are doing that's reflected enough. I mean, we, the diaspora, we are doing our best to reflect as much as we can um, through the sources we have on the ground, through whatever means we have access to, but regardless of, um, how much we make efforts, we have very limited means actually to reflect uh, what they're doing on the ground, their struggles. Um, and they don't give up. I mean, I, I do remember when the Afghan women created this um, uh, campaign of um, uh, bread employment, bread jobs and freedom. And then we had the Iranian um, campaign after that. I mean, I can see how uh, I would love to see both campaign going together, but I, 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 I um, am a little bit disappointed for the fact that the, Af the Iranian women have been given a boost with their campaign just because there is the Iranian regime or there's a political, um, it's a different political uh, case. Uh, but regardless of all the operations we have, regardless of the limited space that they have had, they haven't given up. They go closed door, they, they come out on the streets. I think we do need to acknowledge so that we give them the encouragement to go again on the street. 
we do need to give a boost to what they are doing right now in Afghanistan. But then at the same time, I can also see that uh, the Afghan women inside Afghanistan, there are so many excuses around why they cannot participate in most of the discussions and engagements. I mean, I would love to see the Afghan women in Afghanistan when it comes to engaging or when it comes to uh, the, the discussions about how to engage with the Taliban. I think, I mean, all I would, would like to see is an Afghan woman coming from Afghanistan and talking either online or in person and telling them, what did you, what did you do to us yesterday? And that is more efficient, that is more powerful. I mean, we are trying again to um, reflect their voices as much as we can, but I think it's it's much stronger and much uh, powerful to see those women on, on the ground um, discussing about how they would like to engage with the Taliban. We are here to facilitate, we are here to provide technical support to them. Uh, but I think I would love to see more of those faces who are on the ground in Afghanistan. If the Taliban can travel in person in most of the uh, platforms, I mean, to attend in, in most of the platforms, why an Afghan woman can't do it? I mean, they can't either can't get visas or um, there are so many administrative challenges that I think can be solved easily. Um, so yeah, that, that's one of the areas that I think um, we need to find ways on how to make it happen instead of like providing excuses why they can't attend. Um, and if they are okay with their security challenges, then uh, we shouldn't be, I mean, holding ourselves accountable when it comes to the, um, I mean, we should hold ourselves accountable, but we shouldn't provide that as an excuse. Um, so that, that's another aspect of it. But then we also need to understand uh, how far the civil resistance in Afghanistan can go. We are dealing, as Mr. Andesha mentioned, we are dealing with an oppressive regime that can easily imprison without any accountability, without any uh, third party involvement to hold them accountable. And they themselves, of course, doesn't hold them account themselves accountable and no one's there to hold them accountable. So it's so easy for them actually to arrest women and to the civil resistance or the civil society or whoever. I think we need to have uh, a stronger mechanism in terms of the um, UNAMA is there, but is not doing their job properly, to be very honest. When it comes to watching the humanitarian, the human rights um, violation, but then at the same time being as a um, mechanism, monitoring mechanism to give the protection actually to those who are, um, resisting in a civic way or in a nonviolent way. So they are just on their own. That's all I can say. The civil resistance in Afghanistan, um, at the forefront of it is women, but then also backed by men, some of the men in Afghanistan, uh, they're on their own. UNAMA is not, uh, although, I mean, more part of the mandate of UNAMA is the humanitarian aspect of everything, but uh, it's not doing its job properly. So I'm happy that EU has foots on the ground and I would really encourage UN to uh, EU to um, look into that aspect of um, everything as well. And I'm 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 ex extremely happy about the reports that Richard is is uh, getting out of Afghanistan, which I find them quality reports. But I would love to see more of uh, those engagements. Thank you. I'll now turn to some of the questions um, that, from the audience, and I will either direct them at individuals or ask if anyone wants to answer. But I think the first one I might direct at uh, Mr. Ali Zada. Uh, it's a question by Halim Karazada. Greetings with a distinguished panel address the innate nature of Taliban, their actions such as gender apartheid, forced migration, social engineering of the ethnic makeup in the North of Afghanistan. And in light of the above, whether they can change trusted and ultimately negotiated with. I wanted, you know, this reflects quite a bit of what our previous speaker, Mr. Os Ostrovicius um, mentioned in terms of the ability to trust, uh, you know, whether or not they're a reliable partner. Um, Mr. Alizada, you know, would you be able to answer this question and whether or not you think there actually is potential leverage um, that can be exerted on, on the Taliban in order for them maybe not to fully modify their behavior, but to, you know, to address some of it? Uh, well, basically, um, 
one of the things that's very important is, um, you know, uh, the expansion of uh, what uh, uh, Ambassador Bennett has been doing in terms of um, providing reports and documentation of violations of human rights. Um, so in this case, I think it's important for the uh, for the EU maybe, um, but also other actors within the international community to come together and create a robust mechanism um, that can create um, an evidence base for violation of human rights um, and also to, to technically you know, establish the nature of those violations. Um, now, some of the reports by Amnesty International um, has done um, to, to some degree that job, but I think there needs to be a robust mechanism that can constantly and comprehensively uh, report on the violations of human rights and, and, and on the commitment that the Taliban pledged to the international community. Now, with that comes uh, another thing that's uh, uh, also uh, extremely crucial, which is that there should be a mechanism created by the international community to hold Taliban to account. And in, uh, this should include um, sort of, um, you know, potential uh, legal action against um, particular human rights violations, including those that comprise cases of uh, genocide, for instance, you know, forced eviction uh, of particular populations from particular ethnic groups from particular uh, geographical locations, or those of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, this is also something that's uh, extremely important, but most, uh, most important than all is the fact that, you know, the Doha process made a, a huge mistake of engaging with the Taliban at the cost of excluding the people of Afghanistan. I think that uh, particular mistake uh, should not be made again. Um, so in this process, as um, I'm very happy that, um, uh, you know, two of the speakers um, mentioned the EU is committed to also engaging with the people of Afghanistan, but that uh, promise needs to be, you know, manifested uh, in, a, in a more uh, sort of like, um, tangible manner. Um, this uh, engagement with the people of Afghanistan needs to be uh, broadened and needs to be um, uh, taken to another level uh, because at the moment, it's like engaging with the Taliban at the cost of uh, the people of Afghanistan. The Taliban are consolidating their power under this uh, sort of like engagement, but um, the civil space has uh, is shrinking for the people. You know, when we're speaking about human rights, this human rights needs to also include uh, the political and cultural and economic rights um, according to, you know, human rights conventions. But uh, as we're speaking, um, you know, the freedom of uh, political assembly, for instance, uh, the, free, uh, the freedom of protest and the right to, uh, you know, um, form political parties, for instance, civil uh, society organizations, all of these are uh, illegal in the country. All of them are not allowed. Uh, but then the uh, international actors like the EU and the UN are still uh, engaging with the Taliban without um, really, really taking this very seriously and conditionalizing uh, their engagement uh, with the Taliban uh, on, on these uh, particular issues. So I think those are the mistakes that have been made in the past years, uh, they, they, they need uh, to be avoided. Uh, so in this case, I think one of the things that's important is now for the EU and also the UN and other international actors to, uh, to begin thinking um, about developing a unified, coherent, um, comprehensive strategy as to how these actors can engage with the Taliban. So. Uh, for the past uh, 21 months, um, this has been so much of like, you know, trial and error, mostly experimental in nature, but this needs to come, uh, you know, in the form of a strategy in which um, representatives of different state of the people or, uh, of Afghanistan are also involved in developing that strategy. And there should be particular steps and particular like, you know, measurement uh, units or whatever, uh, the, the mechanism for measurement uh, of, of all of the different steps. You know, the um, international community did this to the previous government of Afghanistan uh, starting from 2012 when they delivered aid and conditionalized all of the, you know, support to the uh, Afghan government to uh, certain um, 
uh, criteria, but that is not uh, now uh, considered uh, when it comes to the Taliban. I think those are lessons learned from uh, the engagement with the previous government and some lessons learned from the mistakes made that need uh, to be taken uh, into account. Thank you, um, Mr. Ali Zada. I think the question of sort of monitoring and accountability, I'm not, not sure that whether or not the feasibility of it, but as you mentioned, um, sort of the importance of monitoring also the money that comes in, given the issue of fungibility of funds. I know a recent report by Afghan Analyst Network mentioned how I think when certain uh, actors took over education, um, not the EU, but other UN actors, um, that you know, this Taliban stopped funding the EU, and we don't know where the you know where they sort of where they moved the, their money uh, to what purposes, whether it was for the benefit of the people. Um, I wanted to ask our European colleagues a couple questions. I'm going to try to group them. Um, one is a question by Oz Hassan. It talks about the fact that we haven't yet mentioned the basic needs approach that's been adopted post-2021. Um, I think other people have called it humanitarian plus basic needs, or no, those are two separate, the basic needs approach. Uh, one is, can we you know, have a better understanding of this? Is this a new policy? And then he asks, is, is, or is it really a repeat of a policy that was prior held by the EU in the 90s? Um, the second question it, I, I wanted to ask was how has the EU been able to navigate um, uh, this woman ban uh, working with uh, the ban on women working with international entities in Afghanistan, including EU and UN agencies? I'm not sure who would like to go first. I will um, first, Ms. Daria, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for allowing me to come in on this. I think I'll be able to explain the, the question of basic needs and livelihoods assistance, it's not humanitarian aid, and we don't necessarily like to call it humanitarian plus, because, um, and and I would like to also come back to the question of the humanitarian aid. Um, uh, our um, honourable member of the European Parliament also talked about more substantially giving humanitarian assistance. Uh, of course, you know, budgetary limitations um, of, uh, of the European Union and other donors and how much this is stretched given also the war right next door to our borders and all the all the competing needs uh, is uh, is to keep in our minds in the background but at the same time um, let's remember that humanitarian assistance is not it's a response to a humanitarian crisis which is really grave which is ongoing but it's not a long-term solution it's not a long-term socio-economic um, response uh, to the plight of the Afghan people. Um, and in that sense, uh, we have to look at uh, in, in an environment where the, the de facto authorities in charge are not able uh, to provide the most basic needs uh, or not willing to provide the most basic needs on education or on healthcare and uh, on other things. Um, how can we help? How can we keep to our promise of helping the Afghan people? So this basic needs assistance uh, and livelihoods assistance is stemming from them, that because uh, humanitarian aid is not uh, it cannot be sustained the levels and it's not the long term solution. So the basic needs assistance comes in uh, to to start looking at maybe not longer term, but more medium term needs of the of the Afghan people. And that is delivered um, directly through the Afghan NGOs, international NGOs and some UN agencies on the ground. Um, which uh, I have to underline does not, neither the humanitarian assistance nor the basic needs and livelihoods assistance go through Taliban authorities or benefit the Taliban. There is a lot of disinformation out there about this and, and I think it's our prerogative to, to constantly say this. The EU would never be able to justify such a thing to our own taxpayers and believe us we we are very conscious of our own taxpayers and our own european parliament and their scrutiny on how we spend our taxpayers money so the eu would never be able to justify such a thing um to to our own taxpayers we're very careful this is, we, there is a monitoring mechanism in place there is the the um uh, the interagency standing committee monitoring mechanism um, on the humanitarian side, the EU has put in place our own monitoring mechanism on the basic needs and livelihoods assistance that we're delivering. 
because of our prerogative also to deliver and be accountable with our taxpayers' money to our own institutions. In this monitoring mechanism, we are working very closely with the civil societies, civil society organizations and international organizations on the ground. So that was a, a very good recommendation, but we're also implementing this. So just to be clear, uh, we're also working a lot with Afghan women on the ground. This is the, our presence there is very important. Um, in Kabul and for as much as we can reach women in the regions, we try to. But let's not forget, not everything we do or we can do on the ground, can we publicize? We have also the responsibility, the prerogative to protect. It's not an excuse. It, and we are not the ones who are gonna decide on this. It's those women that we engage with because they are the ones who live under those conditions. They are the one who have to think about their own security and their own future under those conditions. So we, we absolutely have the obligation to respect their wishes, same with the civil society organizations. If any association with the European Union is going to put their lives at risk, it is not for the European Union to come out and advertise, look what a great job we're doing, bringing together these 50, 100, 150, I don't know how many women on the ground and or publishing photos. So we're very careful uh, about our activities. And this is the, environment we operate in that we talked about in the beginning because there is an environment of regression of rights, systemic violation of rights and an environment of fear being created on the ground. And But what we say that we're trying to do is, uh, is to deliver and to do it despite that and to find those spaces, uh, uh, creative spaces despite, despite that. On the conditionality of aid, I hope Mr. Alizada was not suggesting that we should treat the Taliban de facto authorities that we do not recognize in the same way that we treated the Republic government that we recognize and we had a full scale relationship with. Because this is what I heard from the criticism or from the suggestion that you're putting forward. When we delivered our development assistance through the government of Afghanistan, of course, we have put a conditionality on that development assistance. And there was um, an accountability framework or, or, or a number of uh, conditions we put forward against which the money was delivered directly through the budgets of the, of the authorities. The wisdom, the effectiveness, and the results of that can be discussed. And we have had those discussions within our own lessons learned uh, exercises within the EU. However, in the current situation, and it's the, probably the fifth time I'm saying it, we do not deliver assistance via the Taliban. Because we do not deliver assistance via the Taliban, we are not asking the Taliban neither on what we should deliver assistance on, nor we, that they should be respecting certain conditions before we deliver this assistance to the Afghan people. We're delivering the assistance to the Afghan people directly because the Afghan people need it. Um, on the leverage on the Taliban, and one thing I haven't heard in this discussion, I mean, we have talked about uh, different opposition groups, different civil society and women and the roles and the representativity, uh, but Everyone talked about the Taliban as if it was, it's a homogeneous group. And I think we're, it's all clear for everyone that it, it, it is not, that they also have uh, their differences. And uh, when we're talking about the leverages, we also have to also look at um, those who are willing to engage with the international community and those who are talking to the international community, are, are they the one themselves able to influence the decision-making? let alone the international community itself, but members of the Taliban who might want to project themselves as more moderate or more progressive or whatever you might call them, uh, are they themselves able to influence the decision-making? And who has the leverage on the real decision-makers of the Taliban? And who could have that leverage? And I would really love to hear what that leverage can be. I, we also have within our discussions question marks if recognition is really that leverage. So the, the, these are wider questions, but, uh, but be, before you know, we, we might start thinking if the EU was to condition the humanitarian assistance it's giving to Afghan people, by the way, humanitarian assistance is non-politicized and non-conditional, it's there to deliver for humanitarian needs, but also the basic needs assistance is, has been put there to deliver 
basic services that are lacking from the lives of people who are now living in Afghanistan. Even if we were to condition that to Taliban making certain decisions, do we believe that that in itself would be leverage enough to change the real decision makers of the Taliban, whoever they are, to make those decisions? And in, a, in, a, in an environment where we also questioned, do they care about their domestic legitimacy? And do, do they, you know, how much do they question if they have th that domestic legitimacy? Would what the Afghan people are going through and they're living through or they're thinking um, uh, a, a question um, or a, a, a leverage to them? Uh, and via that indirectly, the, the activities of the EU for the benefit of the Afghan people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Daria. Before I allow Alizada to respond, I just wanted to turn quickly to Mr. Ostrovichias um, to see if you had any remarks on these points. Well, thank you very much. Indeed, I, I definitely have. Uh, so, um, I mean, the channels which uh, can be used in a ways uh, Utilized, I mean, we approach um, uh, Taliban probably are twofold. Firstly, I'm sure that Taliban is very sensitive and very attentively following uh, any political signals uh, which come from the West, in particular the European Union, because the European Union remains and probably will remain uh, the biggest. Uh, uh, humanitarian aid uh, provider to Afghanistan in uh, in years to come. So our messaging, not uh, being silenced, keeping this principle line, repeating our uh, position is important. But Taliban is really sensitive towards this. Secondly, uh, regional partners and uh, neighbors uh, in the region, uh, which uh, have to be and are approached and uh, interacted in this regard. So that's why I think we, uh, we have to use uh, it in a, um, in a constant way, uh, repeatedly, again and again, approaching, uh, talking, uh, trying to find um, more of common line, not necessarily a common line, but more of common line, as well as sending a clear message to Taliban leadership uh, uh, as much as we can. Uh, are there any ways, uh, how can we um, be more present and um, uh, influencing the situation on the ground? Maybe yes. So that's why we call uh, uh, humanitarian assistance plus. What, what is in plus? So again, so we're speaking about some new and innovative ways. Maybe one of the channels of uh, our engagement with the civil society and women on the ground could be through private businesses and some networks which might be supported and must be supported in order to enlarge our partnership and to uh, empower those uh, women and to give them more financial sustainability and influence uh, um, especially in the local, uh, uh, on the local level. So that's why I'm looking forward for uh, some new uh, initiative of this kind from the European Commission, as well as all uh, organizations and partners uh, engaged in uh, Afghanistan for the time of being, in order to find out new channels uh, of communication, as well as um, engagement uh, with the local community. I'm not speaking about Taliban, sorry, but I might be a bit, uh, you know, orthodox in this regard, but uh, I see no chance I mean, of changing Taliban, uh, yeah, generally speaking. Some segments of Taliban, they might be different uh, in years to come, but let's focus on what we have uh, in partnership, meaning women, civil society, organizations which uh, are um, our partners for the time of being. Thank you. Thank you. We're about almost close to time. So I just wanted to quickly allow Mr. Ali Zada and Ms. Jalil to make sort of very brief final remarks, if that's possible, please keep it brief. Um, I'll turn first to Mr. Ali Zada. 
Yeah, thank you. Just for the sake of clarity, uh, I did not suggest uh, basically that, uh, you know, uh, Taliban should be given the same treatment as the previous government was, uh, was, was given. Uh, basically, I was trying to say that, uh, you know, the international community, including the EU, held the previous government more strictly on its pledges than they do the Taliban. So basically, you know, that, that really needs to, to reverse. Um, so, uh, on the leverages, I think there are a few leverages that the international community is not using, um, including, you know, creating an evidence base uh, on, on, which is like, you know, coming through um, a reporting mechanism and a documentation mechanism um, um, on the basis of which the Taliban can be held um, to account. Uh, but also, you know, the important thing um, that the international community now needs, uh, including the EU now needs to engage in a deliberative sort of like process to um, think about more seriously uh, about what those leverages could be and uh, to come up with, uh, with a, uh, an engagement strategy that's uh, comprehensive, that is uh, innovative as other speakers have also alluded to. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jaleel? Um, thank you again. It has been an honor to be part of this discussion. So when it comes to the EU's engagement for the last two years, what I would um, um, like to admire, I mean, on my own behalf and a couple of other Afghan women that I know, is that EU individually and collectively has had a very uh, strong position when it comes to the women's employment and um, in the NGO, international NGOs and uh, um, the women's freedom. And I mean, the good aspect of it is that the message has been clearly communicated by the Taliban. So that's something that we all admire and we all appreciate. The other uh, point that I wanted to raise and we um, I think haven't had the chance to raise is that yes, there is an assumption that the Taliban are um, countering terrorism based on the Doha argument. Um, but I just wanted to add a clarity to that, that it depends on the intention on how they are uh, fighting the ISIS K in Afghanistan. The intention is not to uh, counter an international security threat. The intention, considering that they have their, their close ties with Al Qaeda, so the intention is uh, all about monopolizing the space. So it's an internal uh, issue that they have, all the terrorist groups have among themselves. So we should not label that as if the Taliban are countering that terrorism by um, fighting ISIS here and there. Um, and even we don't know the, the, the details of that. And the other aspect that I would like to raise here, we had a discussion the other day with um, a couple of European colleagues and a colleague from um, a Norwegian think tank raised the issue that counter narcotics is gonna be a, um, a mutual, I mean, um, effort that we can engage with the Taliban on. Let's not forget that the narcotics is still one of the biggest, not one of, but a major revenue source for the Taliban, followed by the illegal mining. So um, it depends. I mean, um, Mr. Darren mentioned on uh, what are the leverages. Honestly speaking, we are all trying to find out what are the leverages. So the part, I mean, the reason that we are all having all these discussions is to figure out who's who among the Taliban. Uh, who has the power, who has the decision-making, um, I would say, authority. Of course, I mean, the supreme leader is there, but he's, I mean, he's a ghost. He doesn't have a face. So the regime itself doesn't have a face. So we are all trying, I mean, on the Afghan side, we are all trying to uh, figure out who among the known faces has got the enough influence, actually, or um, um, can be a channel, actually, to crack the Taliban down. So um, yes, we are all, I mean, the questions that you posed are the questions that we, through all these discussions among the Afghans and with the international community, we are trying our best to respond to most of these questions, but those are the questions uh, that we are trying to, yeah, we are trying to find answers to. It has been a pleasure and honor to be part of this discussion and uh, so much to learn from all the perspectives that colleagues have shared. Thank you, Mr. Leon. I um, completely agree. I think also the wide ranging nature of this conversation reflects the very, the very complexity of the situation we're in and the lack of 
as you say, information and knowledge we have on sort of the intricacies and ground realities. But I really just wanted to thank everybody, um, all our all our panelists for taking so much time and for bearing with me for allowing a nine minute over step on the actual timing of the the event. So thank you very much. I, you know, for me, it was a very enriching conversation. We weren't able to get through all the questions, um, but we hope to be able to continue this again. And also to thank the Afghan Institute for Strategic Studies and EU Watch as well. Thank you.